No, it's not Christmas. But as a granddad, I enjoy Christmas time. I enjoy watching the little ones, the grandchildren, open up their their presents. And um, the real little ones often find that the paper is more exciting than what's inside. You notice that? They do. They, uh, They can spend an hour or more playing with the paper or the box rather than what was inside. Following on from last week, the first three verses of chapter one of Hebrews, where the author of Hebrews describes eight aspects to the wonder and the superiority of Jesus, the author now unfolds how Jesus is also so much more, so much better, so much greater, more superior than even the angels. And that's the next passage we look at. But it's a constant theme throughout the book of Hebrews that Jesus is better, greater, more superior. The author repeatedly shifts our focus off the wrapping onto the greatest gift that's inside. But to those who he's writing to, it must have been a really difficult time for them, a very difficult time to live in for those particularly who had been brought up in Judaism because it required a total paradigm shift. Everything that you previously understood is turned on its head for those who were brought up in Judaism. It requires a total paradigm shift meant that all that they'd believed before, their understanding of the Old Testament, now had to be interpreted in the light of Christ. How God had led them in the past, had revealed himself in the past, was now all pointing to Jesus, to come to a fresh realisation that all that that had gone before was just a reflection, a reflection of Jesus' life, his death and resurrection that all that they had understood before was, in in a sense, the wrapping, a shadow of Jesus' presence and person. Something like this, perhaps. Jesus is now at the centre of history. Judaism leading up to him and the church following on, the church now is a reflection of him, but both pointing to him. The light of the world came in the person of Jesus and history before and after are all in his shadow. Or everything that came before and everything after is to be seen in his light, in the light of Christ. This is why we should not discount the Old Testament. I'd encourage you to read more than just the New Testament for the the New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament and the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. And so the author of Hebrews frequently quotes the Old Testament. As you read the book of Hebrews, you will see him repeatedly quoting the Old Testament because he sees the Old Testament as pointing to Jesus. Remember at the time of writing this, the the New Testament has not been compiled yet, but the author, author most definitely sees Christ in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is Christ centered. And not only did the author see the Old Testament in this way, but so did Jesus. Remember as he walked on the road to Emmaus with two despondent believers, he took time to begin with Moses and then he walked them right through the the understanding, their understanding of the Old Testament and that it was all pointing to the coming Messiah, to him, to Jesus. Jesus understood the Old Testament to be Christ-centred. And so from the close of last week, 
The end of verse 3, after he had provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. It was all finished. It is complete. We pick it up now at verse 4. And so he became as much superior to the angels and the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Although his name is not mentioned in this verse, it's inferred because it's not a name that he has been given but a name that he has inherited. Now you and I are given names and the angels, some of the angels we know of their names. There's Michael whose name means who is like God and is God's mighty angel. But Jesus is more than mighty. He's the almighty. He's the one who is sustaining and maintaining all things by his powerful word. He's greater than a mighty angel. He's the almighty. There's Gabriel, whose name means God is great, and he acts as a messenger for God. Jesus is more than a messenger. He is the message. And another angel, Lucifer, Name of Satan before he fell. His name means morning star. He was created as God's most majestic angel prior to his fall from heaven. Jesus is more than a shining star. He is the light of the world. He is the sun. And we may not normally think of sun as a name... But right throughout the New Testament, we see this. The Son of God, the Son of Man, the Son of David, and elsewhere, Son with a capital S. And his name is inherited. And his name is Son. The Son of God. A fact that the author continues to hammer home 13 times throughout this book. At least once for each chapter. The author then quotes again from the Old Testament, verses 5 to 6. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. As the Jews look back over their history, there were, there were times when God had sent angels to reveal his will and the angels and the prophets were held in high regard to those within Judaism. <clears throat> Evidently there were, or was a, a growing perception that Jesus too must have been an angel. Perhaps because Jesus was accused of blasphemy and killed, others didn't want to be accused of agreeing with his claims. But there was also a number of stories now circulating in the the community about God's angels, again, presently at work. They'd been sent to release prisoners, encourage believers, help travellers. They'd come to assist Peter and John, Cornelius... Philip, Paul, read the book of Acts. This is all happening at the time. Verse 14 says that the angels, good angels as opposed to fallen angels, demons, are sent to serve those of us who are to obtain eternal salvation. Many Christians are unaware of angels but do believe that they exist and assume that they have at times, we have at times come under their protection. Sometimes angels go unseen. At other times, I firmly believe that they take on human form, physical form. But the author is at at pains to point out that Jesus was no angel, He was the Son of God, 
The pinnacle of all God's creative and redemptive work was Jesus. And in fact, the angels ministered to him. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the angels ministered to him. And here they are called to worship him. And they did so at his birth. The angels worshipped him. It is the angel's task to exalt the Son. And he is obviously far superior then to them and so much and so worthy of, of praise. I wonder whether we see ourselves in the same light. Not as an angel as such, but that our purpose as Christians is also to exalt the Son. That was the purpose of the angels. That is our purpose, to exalt the Son, to worship him with all that we are and do and seek to point others to him. Is that how you see yourself? Or do we get sidetracked into many and various other pursuits and become those things become more important to us? It's your task and mine to exalt the Son. The author then goes on to show that angels know their place as servants. Again, quoting from the Old Testament, verse 7, in speaking of the angels, he said he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. The, the works of the angels are temporary, directed by God for specific time and purpose. But the author goes on to declare that the work of the Son is eternal. And the work of the Son is sovereign. He is sovereign. Verses 8 and 9. But about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and you've hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. This is the language of royalty. He's not only the prophet who speaks, he's not only the priest who saves, but he is the king who is sovereign. He is our sovereign king who rules. He has an eternal throne, a royal scepter and a universal kingdom. And the coronating or coronation anointing oil is the oil of joy. And I think that denotes God's surpassing delight in his completed, the completed work of his son. The father is rejoicing in his son. This is my son in whom I am well pleased, my son whom I love. Listen to him, says the father. Is Jesus the king of your life? Is he truly the king of your life? He may well be your saviour. But is he the king? Is he the boss? Is he the one that you obey? So when you know that your response has not been according to the fruit of the Spirit, do you acknowledge that? Do you apologise for that? Do you ask for forgiveness? Is he your king? Is he your king when he calls you into humility and reconciliation with another? Is he your king? What about when you're tempted? Do you give in? Is he truly the king? When you catch yourself thinking about revenge or thoughts that you're, you're even ready to spread rumours or gossip, thoughts that stem perhaps from your rights and entitlements rather than obligations and responsibilities, is he the king for you? Or do you shift him off the throne for a little while? 
Is he truly the king? He is the king because he is sovereign over all. But unlike an earthly dictator, he is benevolent, compassionate, generous. He desires the best for us. And he allows us a free will to choose our own way and to choose our own level of obedience. He is good, he is wise, he is a loving king who always looks out for the best interests of his subjects who love him. And as Christians, there are times when we become more interested in the wrapping than in the gift itself. Our focus can shift from Christ. Inadvertently, we shift our, our focus from Christ to the church. And we want and we expect the church to fulfil our wants and desires. We demand a lot from the church, whatever that means for us. The church, we demand a lot from the church and we're quick to point out where the church has failed us and where other Christians have let us down without even realising that we're now playing with the wrapping and we're not giving Jesus our full and undivided attention. We've shifted our focus back to the wrapping. So is Jesus the king? Is he where your focus remains? And so once again, the writer returns to emphasise that Christ Jesus, the Son of God, was not part of the created order. The angels are and therefore must be submissive to their creator. Again, not all angels are good. Those who have fallen, who, who chose to go the way of Satan are called demons, but all angels can only operate within the bounds that God allows them to. He is sovereign. Jesus, on the other hand, is God's son. He is God's creative agent and he is sovereign over all. He is superior to all. Verse 10. In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will all be changed. <clears throat> but you remain the same. <clears throat> Excuse me. But you remain the same and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels administering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? When the earth will be no more, Jesus will still be the same. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. The classic verse that describes the unchanging Christ is also found in Hebrews, the verse you know well. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Jesus is the unchanging, the eternal Lord to whom God has said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool under your feet. And the picture here is that of a king who has won the battle over his enemy. He has his foot firmly placed over the throat or the neck of his opponent. The day will come when Christ will have all his enemies under his feet and that last enemy to be destroyed will be death. There will be no more death, no dying. And so since God has given us his son <clears throat> and given his son the name that is above every other name, how should we respond to him? Well, in humility and worship. And again, Jesus is our example of that. 
humility and worship. He did just that. He humbled himself before his father. He worshipped him every moment that he walked this earth. Paul wrote these words. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth. Every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Paul went on to say, therefore, because of that, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence but now so much more in my absence, continue. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfil his good purpose with fear and trembling. Is that how we are? Before God, in humility, in reverence, in respect, in awe and devotion. Fear and trembling. Continue to work out. That is to express or to make known, to be obedient in following the Lord's example and looking for his guidance, but to work it out so that others are drawn to the Lord, allowing God to direct and change, bring the changes within us that transform us to continue to work out our salvation so that others are drawn to him. I trust that you have confessed Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. I trust that you acknowledge that he is your king. Are you living your life in the light of your confession? Are you living your life to the glory of God? Is Jesus truly the centre of your focus? Or has the wrapping just taken your attention for the time being? 